My name's Heidi, and I grew up in Hudsonville, Michigan, the oldest of four children. Went to a small conservative church, Protestant Reformed Church is where I grew up. So PR, what is it to be PR? It's your entire life. It's your home life. It's your school life, it's your church life, it's often your work life, it's everything. You don't date outside of it, you don't marry outside of it. It is the church, it's all the church. And that name is, as I really know now, is protected at all costs. So I grew up in that ultra conservative, no dancing, no movies, no, we didn't have a television for a long time, and then we would hide it during the family visitation for a while. Um, so if you know the movie Footloose, think that. That was what I grew up in. So without the big dance that happened, that never, that didn't happen. So um, grew up the oldest of four. I have two brothers and a sister. Loved them dearly. I still love them dearly. Father worked at least two jobs trying to cover the costs. Uh, Christian school is expensive and it was very expensive where we went and it was you had to send your kids to that school. You couldn't homeschool, you couldn't go to a public school, you couldn't even consider a different Christian school. It had to be that denomination school. So grew up going there. It was miserable. I didn't fit into that school. Think Dutch school. You might think blonde hair. You would be right. <laughs> I did not. I was the short, little bit chunky girl with very dark hair and an inquisitive mind, and it didn't fit real well with the kind of woman they really want to see come out of there. So that gets curbed in a hurry, and you learn real fast that asking questions was not okay. I was the family visitation. You don't ask any questions. You don't have any questions. It's embarrassing. Don't embarrass us. So, okay, I guess. Okay. And um, you're told what you believe, but you don't know why. You, you, there's no personal relationship, and it's cold in that aspect. Did the best I can. I was a great student, graduated with honors. So I managed not a lot of friends at that point. We lived in Hudsonville, schools in Standale. So it's not like you live by anybody. And um, so it's very lonely. I always remember just an overwhelming sense of loneliness growing up. I was sad. I remember feeling so sad, even young. I spent a great deal of time at home. I had a fairly large closet that had a light in it. And I would sit in my closet with a book. I read books endlessly. There's times I wouldn't sleep at all at night. I was lost in books. I just read all the time like my out, I guess. You know, you grow up in that. And I did the PR thing, got married right out of school because women don't go to college because you don't really need to have, you know, school loans and stuff like that. You're going to just stay home and raise your kids. So no sense in it. So I went that route. Got married young. I got married at 19. Had four kids quite close together. And by the time my oldest one was approaching six, I knew that my marriage was looking more and more kind of like hell on earth. And I had a husband that I was terrified of. And I couldn't wait till he drove out of the driveway in the morning to go to work and I dreaded when he drove up late at night, usually drunk, usually stopped by the bar, and 
I'll admit that I used to pray for an accident. Just please don't let him come home. Just please don't let him come home. I'm caught in the middle of the life I lead in the one I need. Caught in the middle. And the waves are crashing over. Oh, nobody expects to be sitting in a marriage and suffering. You go through the wedding, you have all these dreams and ideas of what your family's going to look like, and then your reality doesn't match any of those. It's not much of a marriage, and it's not a way that anybody should live, but it was my reality for a very long time. It's like a prison of sorts, I guess, and... Um, It's surprising to think that the person I am now used to be a person that lived. I can't even say that lived, I wasn't living. Survived. Hmm. It's not what marriage is supposed to be. It's what my marriage was though. Uh screaming, always screaming at me. Never knew what for, you didn't know what was gonna be wrong that time. And then you realize he just liked to scream at you. And he liked to shove people around and beat up on people that smaller than him. He liked to belittle, degrade, humiliate. And then you start to realize that married to somebody that actually finds pleasure in that. It's, it's difficult to be a woman and to recognize that you mean so little to the person you said I do to. That if you were going to stick with your forever, that that's what it's going to look like, a forever of that. My kids deserve better. I had to give them better. From like 19 to... 26, 27 years old, it was just a ramped up episodes of violence and sexual assaults and just awful things that should never happen in a marriage. It's not what it's meant to be. There is no friendship. There was no security. There's no sense of safety. There was just nothing. You know, he took the access from me to any money. Um, house, cars, nothing was in my name. So I literally, I, nothing. I, I don't have any credit. I don't have a job. I don't have a bank account. I don't have anything. Um, finally, I reached a point trying to be a good PR girl. We don't ever say the D word there. That's really bad. Went to the minister and the elders and I shared with them what was happening in our home. And I really shared with them exactly what was happening in my home. And if you would have known me at that time, it would have shocked you because Heidi was a make no waves, never said anything. You don't talk about it. Always make sure your family's looked at in good light. You never talk about the bad things. And I found myself talking about rapes and assaults and violence and that that was the reality in my home. Church should be your safe place. 
should be the safest place on earth. That's God's family. Not in that church. God, I'm a little scared To see what goes on in there It's more like a movie scene Like a tithing experience I stuck with their advice for as long as I could physically make myself go through it. Because my spouse was aware that I had talked to people and was seeing a counselor, the anger at home really ramped up. And the conversations people had with him, uh, my father went and beat him up to take care of the problem and fix it, which that went like you expected, because guess who bore the brunt of that? And then he started attacking my oldest child. And my mama heart, she's like, I'm gonna, my kids are coming out of this. And um, I found an attorney. I just literally opened the phone book and tried to find somebody because I didn't know anything about talking to an attorney. <laughs> Divor nobody divorces in that church. You don't go to an attorney. It just doesn't, you just don't do it. And I did, informed the elders, and I immediately got put under discipline. During the course of the discipline, I had probably two or three times a week, I had elders at my home to inform me of what it is that I had to do. And that was to rescind all the paperwork, to put an immediate stop to it, um, they said that what they would allow to happen, and they had somebody ready to do this, they were going to build an apartment in my basement. My husband would live in there because it had to look like we were together. But to get me through this snit that I was having, they would give me my space. <laughs> The information that they had, the knowledge that they had of what was happening for that to be their solution left me speechless. I literally was shocked and I realized that there wasn't going to be help and I knew exactly what was expected of me and that's like, this comes to a stop and you're going to quit it and you're going to get over it and this is what your marriage is going to be you submit to him, he's the head of the house, it is your job to hopefully show him how to be kind. So the victim now is expected to counsel their abuser and fix them. And that doesn't work. One of the brightest spots and the ugliness of those times was in the form of a human named Claire Prince. He was like my angel. It was God taking care of me. Broken people struggle to make decisions. Broken people in a church that abuse them are often paralyzed in fear and can't make a decision. And I think he recognized that. But he also realized within 15 minutes of a joint session together that he was done dealing with my ex-husband. He point blank told him he was never allowed to step foot in his house again. He sent me home with money after he heard how much I was allowed for groceries during the week. He sent me home with money, asked me if I needed to ride to the grocery store. He gave me a little extra. He says, buy something that makes you feel good when you put it in bed. Grateful for those kindnesses, somebody that just recognized that something is basic and shallow, some people would say is 
something to wear that made you feel good. He was the only person I had in my life at that moment that saw how desperately destroyed I was. And even though he was the counselor that I was sent to by my church because he went to the same church with me. He understood how it works there. He also understood that if I told anybody what he had told me to do, that he would have been put under discipline himself. And he chose to love a really broken young mom and her kids enough to tell her, you need to go. He didn't send me away because he didn't want me there. He wanted me to live. He'd be so proud of me right now. He was proud of me when he saw me working as a paramedic. He was just in tears. Everybody that's hurting and going through things like that need a clear prince in their life. I did not stop the paperwork, and I allowed that to continue. So my last interaction with my church was, first of all, my pastor came to the house and um, put on the big loving crocodile tears act, and this is just so, so, so sad, and, and all that, and at the time, I'm just like, believing what he's saying and then he left and within half an hour here comes the other knock and there's the two elders at my door with my papers those papers were my membership in that church and I was given one last opportunity to submit to the mandates that were put before me to stop the divorce proceedings, to allow my husband back into the house, to live with him as a husband and wife should, to submit to counseling in that church, to confess and repent for my sins publicly, which meant I would have to go walk it up those stairs in the front of the church and confess to my sins and ask for forgiveness. And I told them I can't do that. They said that I left them with no choice. And they excommunicated me. And I was shunned. It's a sad thing to know as I've gone back to try and help victims that are there now, to know more than 25 years later, it still happens regularly there. They may say they don't shun. I don't know what else you'd call it when you are excommunicated and your family disowns you. That's shunning and they practice it. used as a tool. They believe if you're humiliated enough and desperate enough, you'll come crawling back. Some people do. Most people just, usually women, like me, are controlled by it. Because when you don't have a job, and when you don't have money, and you don't have outside support, and you know that everybody inside those walls will listen to those leaders, you know that you literally will be left with nothing. 
and they turned around and left, and that was the last interaction I have ever had with that church, with most of my family. My mother's family sent me a form letter and informed me that I was disowned and dead to them. I don't think I mentioned that. My mother's family, they they write the curriculum for the seminary and they run the church. So they had great sense of pride in that and we need to keep the family proud. So I did my best. My father's family just kind of disappeared. My parents, I want to say it was maybe nine months before I even heard anything from them. No, are you making it? Are you surviving? Are the kids okay? And then it's just a, what an utter wicked girl you are. You ungrateful, wicked girl. And that's how my 25-year journey in the desert started. I think I believed those words for like 20 years. Wicked, wicked girl. It's always interesting, though. You know you really love your kids when going to hell was a price you're willing to pay to save them. I believe that's where I was going. I used to talk to God about it. Like, I love you. Is there any chance? Any? I didn't, I didn't attend church in that desert time of mine. I love God. Talk to him all the time. I wept with them every night almost. They're going to find out about me and they're going to kick me out anyways. People find out you're going to hell. They don't want you in their church, so. Um, I had periods of time where I rebelled and tried to pretend it's just fine and things are great and it, maybe God's not real and... You know, maybe I'll, you know, I'll drink at night until I can fall asleep because I just want to forget. I'm thankful that addictions weren't part of my thing. Just the kids. Um, but it was survival all the time. That's all life was. It was just survival. I didn't know how to provide. I didn't know how am I going to make it with my kids. So fell into the trap of meet somebody who seems nice, seems like they want a family, and is just like, you don't know, love them. But my kids will be safe and they'll have a home. So felt like I sold myself. And then you start feeling like you are that worthless, wicked person with no value when you don't have anyone to share your burdens with, when you aren't with people who care for and love you, you have nowhere to go with that. It's just, it's just you and in your head. And, and then for a number of years, I just absolutely believed everything they had ever said about me. I was all those things. But I knew that I needed to make sure that my kids were okay. And... It was just my driving thing, but I was tired. And I had made the decision that after my youngest graduated and finished boot camp, because I wanted to see him do that, that then I could go home, wherever that was. I hoped hell wasn't real, but uh, September 27th. Couldn't be the 26th, that was my sister's birthday and that just didn't seem the right day to die on. So I'll go the day after. And um, all I can say is that God is so good. I filled my hands But my heart was longing for something more And you called 
said you knew me long before I was born. Ooh. Around that point in my life, for no reason other than God putting it in my head because running is not anything that I ever thought I'd love to do. I just decided I plugged into this little thing to run for a little bit. It got me out of the house and that's what I was looking for. It was an out and it was a legit one. Nobody questioned that. And um, I didn't know what God had in store with that one thing. I met someone during that time. Don't know why they intrigued me like they did. People that are going to die don't typically look for people to form a friendship with. And, um, but I could just never shake the feeling. I just had, I just wanted to understand why. What was their story? What was the reason? That was, it was all it was. There was nothing else that was on my mind other than that. It was just an interest. What makes somebody live life? Because I hadn't lived in such a long time. So um, I was a road warrior in 2019 and this person was a road warrior in 2018 that's how we cross paths and um part of that program is you do a lot of community events and a lot of community things so we spent a lot of time together because of that and we had conversations and i started to get more familiar with the story there and um long story short that person ends up becoming my husband We were both so sure of what it wasn't when we first met. And I think God was just laughing the whole time because he goes, I know what this is. I don't think, I know, I know. Robert had no idea that he saved my life. But not only that, I have a best friend and a confidant and a cheerleader And the person who dragged me kicking and screaming back into church. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm like, Our, it's going to be a short lived relationship. I was that mad on the drive into church. I remember it plainly. I was so angry. And yet I had told him yes. And um, he was kind enough to give me an out. It's like, if we're in there, and you literally get to a point and you need to leave. I'm not going to say anything. We will leave. You're going to pay for this. So we went and um, we walked in and people were impossibly kind and jaded me as like, yeah, until you know me. (laughs) And 20 minutes into that sermon message, I'll call it, I won't call it a sermon. That's what I call what I used to have. 20 minutes into that message, I looked at my husband and I said, it is okay to be broken here. Close your eyes and let down your defenses. You are safe here now in the Father's love. Let the mercy take you over. You are home here now in the Father's love. My 25 year desert, desert journey came to an end that day. Oh my goodness. I found myself up front at the end of that service. It's like, Yes, yes, yes. Just taking Jesus as my own, like in every way that that means. And just 
like in disbelief that so quickly this girl, this broken, shattered girl who felt absolute no worth, undeserving of anything, so sure she's going to hell, found herself signed up and getting baptized on Easter Day. Best day of my life. Best day of my life. I came out of that water with a joy that's just indescribable. How do you explain what happens in that water in that moment? And it's just, it's joyful. I spent 25 years believing things that wicked people told me. But then I realized it's not so much that it was wicked people telling me that. The devil's really, really good in knowing how to get to people. I'm starting to think maybe he sensed in me that there was an adversary, that maybe he didn't want me fighting on the other side. Because after that baptism, after receiving his spirit, after being on my knees in the front of my church, literally, I walked up there and just fell to my knees and just talked with God with my church all behind me, literally just saying, whatever you want, I'm saying yes. God forgot to tell me to buckle up because he floored it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm so incredibly blessed to have a God who so fiercely, fiercely loved his daughter and who loved me enough to know that I needed 25 years of awfulness in a desert so I'd be ready for what he wanted to give to me. I wasn't ready before then, and I know that now. It makes sense now. At the time, it didn't. Um, but here I am, baptized, full of the Spirit, going to that same church and excited. I get upset when we have to miss it. And along with my husband, I get to greet every day at church and welcome people in. I've been invited to be part of Stephen ministry at the church where I get to go and love and be with people that are suffering and that are hurting. I'm not any better or stronger or braver or anything than anybody else. I don't know what it was that overrode that last bit of fear that I had about facing all of that. It was awful, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The reality of it is far worse than any words I ever could put together to describe it. I don't judge the women that can't make that decision. I don't blame them because the price is heavy price is really heavy and then it doesn't go away you don't get it back but there is joy to be found on the other side of it I can promise you if you face those fears you'll find it on the other side I promise and you're gonna find people like me on the other side we haven't forgotten you we haven't forgotten what it's like there. I have not forgotten what it feels like because I'm feeling it right now. And to any of you that are there right now, I'm coming.
nobody's victim. I've never been anybody's victim. I might have thought that I was. I felt that I was for a while, but what I didn't realize, I was broken when I was little, and I've been being built over my journey. I'm not broken, and I'm back. You spoke my name and life began. Breath filled dust and sand Felt you in the cool of the night Saw you in the newly made sky And you were mine Take me back to the garden where it all began Take me back to the garden We were walking hand in hand My eyes were filled with wonder My heart was filled with peace Lost in the mystery It's all that I could see Take me back to the car